right, go and grab your Bibles, please, and open the book of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter number 32. 2 Chronicles chapter number 32. We'll read four verses here, then we'll pray, and we'll jump into the sermon this morning. 2 Chronicles chapter number 32. 2 Chronicles chapter number 32. And we'll begin reading in verse number 27. If you please stand in honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. 2 Chronicles chapter number 32, beginning in verse number 27, the Bible says, And Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor. And he made himself treasuries for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices and for shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels. Storehouses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil and stalls for all manner of beasts and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him substance very much. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper watercourse of Gihon and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David, and Hezekiah prospered in all his works. Let us pray. Dear Father, I pray that you'll speak through me during this time. Father, help us to learn, help us to be challenged by the word of the Lord. Help us, Father, to, to apply truth to our lives so we can be more like you. Help, Father, every, every thought, every reword, every action made during this time to be an honor and glory to you and lift up your holy name. Help us, Father, to, to strive to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Thank you. you may be seated. Uh, quick question. How many have seen the uh, Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Curious. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't think a lot of people. Uh, it's a much older movie, okay? Jimmy Stewart, old, old stuff right there. Uh, most people have no idea who that is. He was an actor, okay? Uh, but yeah, it's a wonderful life. Very old Christmas movie. Well, relatively old. Um, but it was a Christmas movie, and it's about a guy by the name of George Bailey. Now, for those of you that have seen this movie, I wrote these notes down purely on memory, so if I say something wrong, that's the way it was, I promise you. Okay, so it's a wonderful life about a guy by the name of George Bailey, and it's basically his life story. It's a recap of his life story up into the climax of, of his life and, and a, a tragedy that's happening, and, and it recounts all of the things that he had done in his life and all the things that he had gone through. Uh, he was a boy that had great aspirations. Uh, as the story goes, he, he, was, he was wanted to be a world traveler, wanted to be an adventurer. He just could not wait to get out of his hometown of Bedford Halls to, you know, knock the dust off his feet and, and go see the world because this was a small, tiny little, you know, one stop light town type of deal. And uh, he was ready to go see the world. He wanted to see what the world had to offer. He was going to be a world traveler, all these things. You know, he just could not wait to get out of Bedford Halls to live his life. Well, as the story goes, uh, uh, when his uh, uh, during uh, during the end of a school year, he he had gra he was a graduate now, and he was getting ready to go to college. And in fact, for a while now, he had been getting ready to go to college, but things had gone up and things had gone up, and he just never was able to to make it. But now he was getting ready to go, and he could not wait. To, to set off on his, his great thing that he was going to do and become this traveler and all these wonderful things that he was going to do with his life. And, uh, but what happened is, is tragedy. Uh, his father, who uh, uh, was a businessman, he, he, he and his brother, his father, uh, Peter Bailey, he and his brother uh, owned a business called Bailey's Brothers Building and Loan. Association and basically what it was was it was a building and loan company. If you wanted to build something or if you just needed a general loan, that's who you would go to. It wasn't like a full-on bank, but it was mainly there to help people get loans. That was their job. That's what they did. And basically, what happened is his father had a heart attack and he died very suddenly, unexpectedly. And uh, George Bailey's father, Peter, died, and his brother was not able to run the business all on his own. And long story short, the board of trustees met and said, look, George, the only way we're going to keep this building and loans open is if you take it over. If you don't take it over, we're shutting it down. Uh, we're going to dissolve it. We're not going to do anything with it. And uh, 
George Bailey decided that he was going to stay and take it over because he understood if he did not, then all the people of Bedford Falls would have to go. Their only hope of getting any loan or any upward mobility would be through the old miser, greedy Mr. Potter, you know, the evil guy of the story. And, and that was the deal. Was And that's why he decided to do it, because he knew that, uh, you know, Mr. Potter was not going to treat them fairly. He was not going to treat them with the respect and the kindness that his father had, because his father was not in the business. Obviously, his father was in the business to make money, because, you know, he needs to live. He needs to be able to pay for a home, pay for his family. But he wasn't out there trying to squeeze every penny out of everyone. He was out there trying to make a living, yes, but trying to be a help. See, he, he looked at his business as a means of helping his fellow man be able to do things, to go out and try. Do you want to try and build a business? Here, let me see if I can help you. Let me see if I can get you a loan to try and do something, to try and make something of yourself, to try and give you an opportunity to do these things. And that's what Bailey Brothers Building and Loans Association was all about, was trying to help their neighbor, trying to help their fellow man in Bedford Falls to become something, to do something, to, to have some upward mobility. And George Bailey decided to take up the mantle that his father had left when he died and he did. And he said he did not give up his dreams of world traveler and all these things. It was his idea that he would do it. He would keep it going. He would find somebody else. He would figure out how to keep it running. And then he was going to turn it over to somebody else. Or uh, actually, I think it was his brother was supposed to come back after he finished college. And he was going to take care of it. And then it was going to be George's turn to, to go become the world traveler and to do the things that he wanted to do. Long story short, that just didn't happen. Things kept on coming in the way, and year after year after year, and a decade passed, and all this time goes by, and George's life is flying by, and he's just the owner, the CEO of the building and loan. But all of those years, George had been able to help so many people of his community, so many of his neighbors he was able to help uh, uh, who had nothing when they first came or had very little, and he was able to help them keep their business running or start their own business or start these endeavors that they had a dream to try and do, and he was able to help them in so many ways. Years had gone by now, and he was still in charge of the building alone, but then one day in the heart of the Christmas season, tragedy strikes. Uh, a sum that would be an insurmountable sum of money was lost, which obviously if you have a, a financial institution, money disappearing is a very bad thing. And uh, whoever's in charge will definitely go to jail if money just disappears, especially when you're dealing with other people's money, which is a building and loan is. And an uh, insurmountable sum for their day and age disappeared. And this was tragedy. This was absolute pandemonium because this meant very bad things for George Bailey and the Bill Bailey Brothers Building and Loan, because it was not going to stay, it, it, it was not going to stay open. They were going to get shut down. They were all going to get thrown in jail because this money was gone, and the only thing that you could assume is that they stole it, that they took it, and that they were going to use something wrong for it. In desperation, George Bailey would then run, just not knowing what to do. He had racked his brain on how to take care of this, how, how to find a way out of it, but he could not find a way, and he would run. And ultimately, he decides that suicide is the only answer. And this is where, you know, the famous line comes from, it's a wonderful life, it would have been better if I had never been born. George is then shown what the world would look like if he or no one like him had done all the things that he was able to do, that he was used to do in Bedford Halls and all the things that he was allowed to do. Eventually, George begins to come around and changes his mindset on the situation and the things that are in his life and even the things that he faces at that time. He knows that he is facing a serious trouble, a serious allegation, but yet his mindset has changed and his outlook has changed. He sees the world in a different way, or he could say he sees it again as he once did before when he had that mindset of, even though this is what I want to do, I, I, I'm willing to make a sacrifice to help the people of Bedford Falls since my father is no longer here. I, I'm willing to make a sacrifice since I cannot go and do the things I wanted to do. I'll make this sacrifice to help them. 
I'll stick my head out. I'll stick my, uh, I'll step out on the limb for you so you have an opportunity to build this business that you have a dream to do. This is what George Bailey did. So understand, that's, that's the mindset I want you to think about. We'll come back to George Bailey a little bit later and, and just sum it all up. But I want us to look in our Bibles here at 2 Chronicles chapter number 32, what we read to begin it all. We see here, we're talking about Hezekiah, the king of Judah. Hezekiah. The Bible lists here in Hezekiah chapter number 32 and verse number 27 through 30, it lists the, the, the amazing things that Hezekiah had, the amazing things that Hezekiah had done, and all the blessings that God had given. We see that in verse number 29. It says in the very end, For God had given him substance very much. God had given Hezekiah many things. Now understand, this is on the tail end of the kingdom of Judah. Judah is winding down, and it's going to be a very short time until Judah is gone, until Judah gets taken away into captivity. This is not the heyday of Solomon and all the wonders and glories that Israel would have. This is the very tail end of the story. This is the very tail end of the kingdom, and to have this great wealth, this great king, was a oddity, and it was only by the grace of God. Let's go to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 20, 2 Kings chapter 20, this is dealing with the same time in Hezekiah's life where he has all these life accomplishments, he has all these things, all these things going for him. At this time in Hezekiah's life, uh, he was nigh unto death. He was sick and God had the prophet of the Lord, God had his man go to tell Hezekiah, he says, Hezekiah, you're, you're sick and you're not going to recover. You're going to die of this sickness. And Hezekiah began weeping and begging to the Lord for more time. Right. He begged of God to say, please, give me more time. Save me from this illness. Right. And God listened. And God granted Hezekiah more life. He says, okay, because you have asked me, I will give you more life. I will give you more time. He was not, uh, Hezekiah did not have an illness because he was a wicked man or because he had left the Lord. It was just God said it's time. But because Hezekiah asked, God says, okay, because you, are, because you are my dear servant, because I love you, and because you have asked me, I will give you more time. That kind of sets what's going on here. 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse number 12. The Bible says, at that time, Berod, uh, Beronic Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. So this is right at that time of his life that he heard Hezekiah was sick. He heard he was nigh unto death. Obviously now Hezekiah has recovered. The Lord has spoken to him and told him, I will give you more time, Hezekiah, because you have asked me. But the king of Babylon heard. He heard that Hezekiah was sick, and so he sent him a letter. He sent him a present saying, hey, Hezekiah, heard you're sick. I hope all is doing well, you know, like we did today. Get well soon. You know, hope you're feeling better with a little balloon attached, all that good stuff. They still did that back then. Okay, But this is what he did, and this is the time. So obviously there was an entourage from Babylon there showing uh, 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 their care for Hezekiah and showing that we heard you are sick, we hope you get better, all that good stuff. In verse number 13, and Hezekiah hearkened unto them, and showed them all the house of his, of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures they, that I have not showed them. So we see here, once again, we read in Second Chronicles chapter 32, verses 27 through 30, we see all the listings of all the things of Hezekiah. And if we look here in 
uh, 2 Kings chapter 20, we see it's almost, that, especially that first portion, it's almost a word for word. Gold, silver, spices, precious ointment, all these things that God had allowed Hezekiah to receive. And God had given Hezekiah because he trusted him, he followed him, and he did what he told him to do. We see these things. So we know this is talking about all the things God had given Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah was a faithful king. He was one that the Bible describes as did right in the sight of the Lord, like David, his father, meaning, you know, his father's 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 father, David, king of Israel, the first good king of Israel. Hezekiah, undoubtedly a good king, probably even described as a great king. This is, once again, the Hezekiah that desired to please and trust God. This is the king that stood seemingly alone when Sennacherib came and wanted to threaten Jerusalem and wanted to take over Judah. Once again, we went over that a few weeks ago on a Sunday night. We talked about the time that Hezekiah stood there and the armies of Sennacherib uh, uh, encamped around Jerusalem and Hezekiah was seemingly all alone, especially as a king. He was all alone. There was nothing he could do. His army was no match for the army of the Assyrians. There was no way out, humanly speaking, that he was going to be able to get the victory. Not a chance. Not a chance. But Hezekiah, his first reaction was, let's pray. His first reaction was, even actually before they went to pray, his first reaction was, God will deliver us. You see, Hezekiah had that understanding, he had that faith before he even went to the throne of grace. Before he even dropped to his knees, he knew, I have done right, I am following the Lord, and God has made us a promise. God made us a promise all the way back with Moses. That if you keep my commandments, then I will be your protector. Amen. And Hezekiah knew we are doing right, so God will be our protector. Amen. Hezekiah is the one that when he received a letter from Sennacherib, a personal handwritten letter from the king of Assyria, one of the most brutal men in all of history, when he received the handwritten letter that was basically saying, Hezekiah, you're a fool. You're going to be dead. I'm going to feed you to the birds, things, all that stuff like that about how he's going to destroy Jerusalem uh, because of what the Assyrians did. The Assyrians, if a city didn't utterly capitulate and surrender the second the Assyrians showed up, it was going to be a bloodbath. It was going to be horrific. They would do it for a reason because they wanted to show a lesson to all the other cities around. Basically saying, you don't want to surrender to us, this is what's going to happen to you. All the savagery and barbary that you could think of, that's what the Assyrians would do. They were wicked, heathen, barbarous people, savages. In fact, it's the Assyrian kings that legend says that their most uh, ardent foes, the ardent kings that gave them that they thought was their best catch or their best attack or their best victory, they would oftentimes embalm and stuff their body and keep it in their bedroom, which is... Kind of strange. But it's like a hunter would today when they have this buck that's, oh man, this is the best thing I ever got. That's kind of what they did with the king's body that they would conquer. Oftentimes they would keep their heads of their conquered kings as a, show, as a showcase of all their trophies. Look what I've done. And they would keep that either in their throne room or in their bedroom. Which, you know, how'd you like to wake up to that in the morning? <laughs> you know, ah, there he is, okay. Uh, hopefully he doesn't fall on you in the night. <laughs> that's kind of strange. But that's what they would do. Could you imagine such savagery and butchery and barbarism that you would keep a dead corpse in your throne room or in your bedroom just to show off to everyone, hey, look what I did. I killed that guy. <laughs> and now I have him stuffed in my bedroom. <laughs> but that's what they would do because they were absolute butchers. They were wicked, vile men. And that's who they were. That's who the Assyrians were. And that's who Hezekiah stood against. That's who Hezekiah said, Father, he la the, the Bible says that he laid the letter down before God and he says, you're the only one that can do anything about this. Right. We trust in you. And God sent back to Hezekiah, I'll take care of it. And he did. He killed pretty much the whole army of the Assyrians and Sennacherib had to go back to his own country by himself in utter defeat. He lost all of his soldiers in the middle of the night, and they all lay dead on the ground, not a single wound on them. They were just dead. His whole army, just dead on the ground. 
wake up in the morning and they're all dead and he has no idea what's going on. He has no idea what to do and he went back home and when he got back home because of his defeat, because of his dishonor, his own, two of his sons came and when he was worshiping his God, they came behind him and stabbed him in the back because their father was a failure and they wanted nothing to do with him anymore. That's who the Assyrians were. But that's who Hezekiah stood up against. Once again, King Sennacherib had never known defeat. This is his first time really facing true defeat. But that's who Hezekiah trusted the Lord in. That's who Hezekiah stood alone and God told Hezekiah, you did right. I will protect you. This is the king that was dying and because he begged of the Lord for more life, God says, okay, I will give you more life. Just imagine having that relationship with God to where God says, it's your time, but because you say, Father, please give me more time, he says, okay, because you asked, I will give it to you. That, that's someone who has a close relationship with their God. Because he asked it, God granted it. That's who Hezekiah was. That, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty fascinating that he had that sort of relationship with God, that he had such a trust in God that even when Sennacherib was there, he knew God was going to protect. That he, when he was faced with certain death because God told him, you are going to die, Hezekiah. Hezekiah said, Father, please just give me more time. Right. And he said, okay, because you asked, Hezekiah, I will grant you more Amen. time. King Hezekiah stood for right. And with the Lord and trusted in God when there was no hope or no sign of any way of escape. That's what happened when King Sennacherib was there. The entire army of the Assyrians was entirely encapsulating the city of Jerusalem. There was no way he was getting out. No chance that he could get out. And he trusted God. We see that after Hezekiah stood with the Lord when Sennacherib had threatened. After Hezekiah faced certain death. After those things, we see now the Lord is listing in 2 Chronicles, even in 2 Kings, we see God listing all of the things that God had allowed Hezekiah to do and that God had given Hezekiah in his time of kings. All the great things, all the wonderful things that God had given, that God had blessed with, that the Lord had allowed Hezekiah to do. Not all of it was just things, there was accomplishments. He was the one that was able to, uh, to, to, to divert the river, Gihon, down to Jerusalem to be of a great help to the farmers and to the city of Jerusalem, having another fresh supply of water. That's not something modern people would find like a great undertaking, but he was able to do it in ancient times. That's a big deal. We see all the things that God listed in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, 27 through 30. The gold, the silver, the spices, the precious ointments, all the things that were in his house, all of his treasuries, all the things that he was able to do. And then the Bible says, for God gave him much. For God provided him with much. And we see here in 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse number 12, we see the Babylonian king has heard of the sickness of Hezekiah. He's heard that he was sick and he is sending them letter and, uh, 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 some letters and present to show him that, hey, I heard you were sick. I hope you're feeling better or whatever they were saying. And when they come with these things, Hezekiah welcomes them in. He hearkens unto them and says, come on in, guys. Let me show you around. You've come to my house. You've come a long way. Let me show you the things that I have that the Lord has blessed me with. Let me show you these great, awesome things that I have in my house. And that's what it says. That's what it says in verse number 13. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointments, and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. He shows them everything. All the great things, all the precious things, all of the things that he has, and all of his dominion, all of it. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse number 31. There's something I want us to see here that God specifically says about this time in Hezekiah's life. This is the verse that really 
pulls all things together and that I want us to understand and learn from and challenged by this morning. Second Chronicles chapter number 32 in verse number 31. In 27 through 30, God lists all the things that Hezekiah had during his reign, all the blessings that God had given him, that God had given him. For, once again, for God had given him substance very much. God had blessed Hezekiah greatly for his faith and his trust in the Lord. But then in verse number 31, the Bible says this, about this exact thing that we're reading in 2 Kings chapter 20, about the time when the Babylonian ambassadors came. In verse number 31, it says this, How be it, in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. God left Hezekiah. Not because Hezekiah was wicked, no. Not because Hezekiah uh, wanted to do wicked or wrong things or was like Ahab or something like that, no. Why did God leave Hezekiah? For one reason. It was to try him. That he might know all that was in his heart. Hard. God says, you know what, Hezekiah, it's time for a test. Right. It's time for a test. Just like what God does to us and throughout all of the scriptures. We can go all the way back to the book of Genesis and see time and time again where God uses tests to see, have we learned the lesson yet? How, how much do we know? How much have we matured? One of the greatest examples of going through tests is Abraham. I mean, Time after time after time, God is testing Abraham in one thing. He's testing Abraham's faith. Do you trust me, Abraham, to do everything I tell you to do? To trust me even if it doesn't make sense. Happened time and time and time again. And Abraham would fail and fail and fail. He failed when he, went down, when he, when he left originally and God told him to leave all. And he didn't leave all. Oh, I don't know. I might need this stuff. I might need some family with me. Lot, dad, you come with me. He didn't trust. He went down to Egypt. He didn't trust. When he was in Egypt, he lied about his, Sarah being his wife. He did not trust. Time and time and time again. When he listened to Sarah to go into Hagar so she could bear him a son, he did not trust. Time and time again, Abraham was given a test and he would fail. But God kept working with Abraham. God kept giving Abraham another chance. And eventually, Abraham finally learned the lesson to trust God, to truly have faith in God. And that's when God told Abraham, he says, Abraham, take your son Isaac, your only son Isaac, and sacrifice him to me. No question. No retort. No, but you said. He said, okay. And his Bible says the next day, the next morning, right away. Got up, and they went. Now, once again, at this time, Isaac was probably in his 30s. He was not like some young 13-year-old boy in his 30s. And Abraham went all the way to the place where he had the knife in the air, ready to plunge it into his son's chest and kill him. Because God told me to. And at that moment, God stopped him and said, enough. I know you believe me. I tested you, and you passed. Abraham, you finally got it. God would do that time and time again with his son Isaac, with Jacob, with Joseph, all throughout the Bible we see with Moses, God allows times of testing to come to either see what's in our heart or to help grow us so we can learn more of what we need to learn. And that's what's happening here with Hezekiah. God says, Hezekiah, you've done a lot. You stood strong when Sennacherib came. You asked me for more life when your sickness was horrible. But let's see your heart. 
Let's see what you have learned in the years that you have been following me. He should have learned a lot. He should have known a lot. And that's what God says. God left him to try him. If God is trying you, that means God says, there's something I should see in you. A trying time from God is not a time of, uh, of sadness. It should be a time of God thinks I'm ready for the next level. Because the only time you receive a test is when it's time to move on to the next chapter. That's what a test means. A test means we're coming to the close of a section and we're getting ready to go on to the next section. That's what a testing is all about. It's going to the next chapter. It's going to the next deal. It's going to the next area. So if a testing comes from God, that means God's trying to say it's time to move on. Let's see if we're ready. We see here when the ambassadors came, the Lord left Hezekiah to try him. So he could know, Hezekiah, what do you know? What's truly inside your heart? What have you learned from your time as king and your time following me and the man of God? What have you learned, Hezekiah? Many times the Lord will try us. He will allow things to come that don't make sense, that don't seem like they align with what God wants. They don't seem like it, it makes sense to, to what God has told me to do. I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm living the life that God wants me to live. I'm trying to please him in all things that I do. Why are these things coming along? Why are these hard times coming? Why did God allow these things to come into my life? He allows things to happen, and many times it's God trying us to see, have we learned? Are, are, are we ready for the next lesson? Are we ready to go on in faith and trusting to take on the next challenge? Or, like Abraham, do we need to try again? Do we need to try again? God is a long-suffering and a patient God. He's willing to try again. He's willing to give another chance. It's like Christ with the disciples. When you read about Christ with his disciples, most of the time when Jesus Christ is speaking with the disciples, most of the time he's asking them questions. The reason being is because questions reveal what's on the inside. If I ask you a question, you answer it and you tell me what you believe or what you think. And so he's asking his, for instance, when, uh, when uh, Peter, uh, when uh, he talked with Peter, and he said, Peter, who, whom, when he talked to his disciples, he says, whom say, that, whom, say uh, men, uh, whom do men say that I am? And he said, oh, some say a science. Uh, some, say, some say a prophet. Some say this. Some say that. And then he asked, whom do ye say that I am? And in other places of the Bible, Jesus Christ, when they pose a question to Christ, or, they, or they're trying to talk to him about something, he'll ask them a question. Because he wants to see how much have you learned from my time with you. From the time that I've spent with you. From the time that you've been around me. Have you learned? What's in your heart? Christ often does that with his disciples, to gauge their maturity, to gauge their understanding, to see what's truly in their heart. Christ would often ask them questions. He would try them. That's, that's, once again, that's what a test is composed of. A test is composed of questions. So Christ would offer them questions to see what they would answer. God would pose us with situations to see how we would react, to see how we would carry ourselves through these times of trial or temptation. Right. Hezekiah, a great and godly king. God was now testing to see what was truly in the heart of Hezekiah. If I left Hezekiah to make a decision on his own, what decision would Hezekiah make? As it says in the book of Romans, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wanted to know, how much have you transformed, Hezekiah? How much have you changed to be what you ought to be? Or how much are you just following direction and leading? How much have you truly learned of me? And how much are you just kind of following step-by-step -step painting? Have you really learned the heart of God? 
That's what God said of David. He said, a man after mine own heart. A man that with all his being desires to do what I want. How would it be if God were to try you this morning? What would he see show up in your heart? What had Hezekiah learned? What did Hezekiah know about the truth of the heart of God? And the understanding and the wisdom that comes from God. You see, when when Solomon was first made king, God came to Solomon in a dream and asked him and posed him a question. Ask of it, and I will give it thee. You ask for it, Solomon, I'll give it to you. Whatever you want, you ask for it. It's yours. And he asked for the most amazing thing. Something that, if it wasn't in the Bible, I don't think any of us would ever think of it. He asked for an understanding heart. And the reason why he asked for it was so he could rightly rule the people of God. He said, I have a job that's above me. I don't know what I'm doing. I need an understanding heart so I can rule your people the way they deserve, the way that you want. I need your understanding heart. That's what Solomon asked for as a young man, relatively speaking. God left Hezekiah. He left him to try him, to see what was in his heart. What does your heart show? If you were put in the same place of Hezekiah, what would God see in your heart? What would show forth in the truest form of who you are? So what did Hezekiah do? What we see in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 12 through 15. He hearkened unto them and showed them all, everything he had. And then the, and the man of God comes in uh, uh, chapter, uh, in verse number 14. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto, Hezekiah, unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? Where came they from? And he said, A far country, even from Babylon. And he says, What have they seen in thy house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in my house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. So what did God see when he left Hezekiah? He left Hezekiah to see what was in his heart. And God has shown. So let's see, what did God see? In verse number 16, in 2 Kings chapter 20, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse number 16. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come, that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. You see, what did God see when he left Hezekiah? When he tried Hezekiah to see what was in his heart, what did God see was in the heart of Hezekiah? He saw Hezekiah had lost sight of importance. His priorities had gotten switched up in this time of being king. He was no longer the same Hezekiah that when Sennacherib was on the outside of the walls of Jerusalem threatening to conquer, threatening to kill. He was no longer that same king that immediately ran to God. He was no longer that same king that his first reaction was, God will be our savior. He was no longer the king that first went and laid down the letter before God. He was not that same king. His time of being king, he had lost sight of what is important. You see, his walk with God was not as important as it once was before. 
And when God left Hezekiah to see what was truly in his heart, God saw what was truly in the heart of Hezekiah. The Lord wanted to know what was really going on. And Hezekiah showed what was really going on. You see, Hezekiah showed that he had allowed the blessings of God and even the things of God to become more important than God and his relationship with God. Hezekiah was more worried about showing off all the things that was in his house. He was more worried about showing all the things that he had. All the things that he had done, all the wonders of his domain. Hezekiah was too worried about that and less worried about the God of Israel. There is no mention of God. There, there is no mention of, of the wonderful things that God has done, of the God of Israel, the God of Judah. There is no mention of that. There is no mention of the greatness and goodness of the Lord. It's just, ooh, this is mine. Ooh, look at all these wonderful things that I have. In fact, the king of Babylon even had heard of these things. That's what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. It says, Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. They heard, hmm, this king Hezekiah has got some stuff going on down there. Let's go see what's really going on. You see, if Hezekiah was truly worried about the things of God and was truly in step with the Lord and what God had wanted, when God had left him, his heart would not have changed. His heart would have remained the same and he would have had the discernment to understand there's something fishy going on here. Why are these men come out of nowhere to see if I'm okay. Oh, they heard he was sick. So that was their pretense to come. But they didn't care about King Hezekiah. They came because they had heard of the wonders of the land. They heard. They've got some stuff over there. they got some nice stuff. Let's go check it out. We'll send him a letter and send him a present and say, we hope he's doing well. And then maybe he'll show us around. And we can see all the good things that he's got. You see, Hezekiah had lost sight on the importance of his walk with God yes. as opposed to the importance, and he set the importance upon the things that God had given him. Because the Bible says God had provided him. God had given him very much substance. It was blessings of God upon Hezekiah, but Hezekiah lost sight on what was important. Amen. And he began going after the things that he had been given as opposed to his relationship with God. Once again, some of the saddest things we ever see, especially the, 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 the culmination and the best way it's ever written in the Bible is with Samson. When the Bible says, and he wist not that the Spirit of the Lord had gone from him. That's one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible. Someone that knew what it truly meant to have the Spirit of the Lord upon them, to move mightily on him, and to do wondrous and superheroic type feats because the Spirit of the Lord moved upon him. And the saddest verse, and he wist not that the Spirit of the Lord was no longer with him. Can you imagine become so hard-hearted and so cold to the things of God that you don't even know if God is with you or not. If God is in your heart and indwelling and leading you, or if he took a step back to see what you're going to do. I wonder if Hezekiah was in the same place that maybe he noticed something, but he just brushed it under the rug, or maybe he was just in the same place as Samson, and he wist not that God had left him. Or did you just get up like any other day and, oh, let's just go about business. Ooh, some visitors. Let me show them how great King Hezekiah is. <laughs> you guys, wait to see what you have seen. I heard of Babylon, but wait till you've seen my house. Wait till you've seen my house of armors. Ooh, look at all these things. Look at all my gold, all my silver. You guys don't know the half of it. 
This is all mine. As opposed to having the discernment of the Lord. As opposed to understanding something does not seem right. All Hezekiah was doing was tripping over himself as fast as he could to show off who Hezekiah was. Look at me, guys. I'm just like your king. I know your king has a lot of stuff. I know he's pretty powerful. I know he's pretty rich. I'm just like your king, right? Look at all this wonderful stuff that I had. Hezekiah wanted everyone to know he was a big shot too. Look what all I got. Look at all the things that I have. Not a mention of God. Not a mention of the things of the Lord or the good things of God or the blessings of God. It's just this is who Hezekiah is. This is the great king, Hezekiah. See, God allowed Hezekiah to make that decision without his guidance just to truly see what is in the heart of Hezekiah. If you were in Hezekiah's place, would the story be the same? Would it be even worse? God does try us quite often. God will say, let's see what's in your heart. I'm going to let you make this decision on your own. I want to know, are you following me? Are you trusting in me? Or are you trusting in what I have given you, in the blessings that I have provided? Think about that. The downfall of Hezekiah was the blessings of God because Hezekiah had forgotten, had allowed himself to forget Who was the one that gave him all these wondrous things? Remember, Hezekiah, if God was not there, all these things would already be long gone when Sennacherib came around. You'd be dead, all of your stuff would be gone, and you'd no longer be the great king, Hezekiah. You'd just be another checkmark on the king of Assyria's list of countries. That's all you'd be, Hezekiah, if it wasn't for God. But Hezekiah's heart had changed. His mind was no longer the same as it once was. He was obsessed with showing off and impressing, get this, the enemies of God. Rather than pleasing and acting the way that his own God wanted him to act. He was more worried about showing off to the pagans, to the heathens, and the enemies and haters of God than he was about pleasing his own God. About saying, what do you want me to do? No sign, no inference that Hezekiah even sought for God's counsel. That he even sought for God's way. Because he was too worried about showing off to everybody else. Does the Lord need to take away some of our blessings so we can once again see him for who he, who he truly is? So it says in the book of Proverbs, the proper writer says, don't give me too much, don't give me too little. Because if I have too much, I, I might think I've got it all together. I, I might think I don't need you anymore because I've got enough. But if I have too little, I I don't want to get to a place where I despise you. Just give me what's convenient for me. That's all he asked for. That's all the proverb writer was asking for. Just give me what's convenient. I don't want to despise you because you've given me too much or you've given me too little. Just give me what's convenient because he understood the fragility of his flesh. And understanding, I, I don't trust me. I don't trust me. You see, that's the problem with Hezekiah. Is Hezekiah at one time didn't trust himself. But now that's the only person Hezekiah did trust. Was himself. To try him. God is trying you. Constantly. God's trying you because he wants to see what's in your heart. 
He says, I've got a job for you. I've got things I want you to do for me. But I need to make sure I know what's in your heart. I need to make sure your heart is something I can use. And not something that's going to try to impress and placate my enemies. And placate those that hate me. But I want your heart to be one that says, I don't care what they do. They can come, they can go. makes no difference to me. I want to please you. I I want to be one that proclaims your honor and glory. That is who Hezekiah had become. One of the greatest kings in the kings of Judah had become a man that trusted all he could do and no longer trusted in God. In fact, to show how much Hezekiah had changed, you know what his response was to Isaiah telling him all the things you just showed off because you did? They're gone. They're going to be taken away. And it's going to be your son's that are going to be taken away in their lifetime. You know what Hezekiah's response was? Get this. Show you how far he had gone. Verse number 19. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. Nothing wrong with that. The word of the Lord is always good. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? As opposed to becoming overwhelmed with his failure, overwhelmed with a thought that I left God behind and I had no idea, that I had strayed so far from God that I was more worried about the things that he had given me than my God himself. No, he was more worried about at that time at least it's not going to happen while I'm alive. Right. About his own sons. Yeah. That's how far a great king and a great man can fall. Right. He was not stricken with grief and heartache that because of his actions, his sons would suffer greatly. Yeah. No, he was just happy. <laughs> Well, it's not going to happen while I'm alive. It's going to be good while I'm king. Because Hezekiah no longer cared about the things of God. He only cared about Hezekiah. How sad that is. How tragic that is. See, God wanted to see what was in the heart of Hezekiah. And he saw. And it's no wonder It's no question now why Hezekiah's sons were the way they were. After Hezekiah, there's only going to be one more good king. All the other ones are going to be wicked. All the other ones, for at least the majority of their reign, are going to be wicked men. And they're going to go a whoring after wicked, false gods and trying to please themselves. I wonder why. Maybe it's because they saw dad or granddad. That's what he had become. When anyone talked about how great Hezekiah was, he's like, yeah, that's good. But the Hezekiah of old used to say, no, God's the deliverer. These are all things God has given me. I, I am no one special. This is all the Lord. Amen. But now Hezekiah was good as the word of the Lord. Whew. It's not going to happen while I'm king. My histories will be good. My histories will be clean. That's all he was worried about. That's what was in the heart of the great king, Hezekiah. And he once was a man of the utmost faith in God. And now he was only worried about himself 
and what people would think about his reign when they read the histories. Ah, oh, my days will be good. Who cares about my sons? <laughs> Their problem, not mine. I was a good king. Guess it's going to be their problem. How sad that is. How about you? You know, in order for you to get a right, uh, a right look on the things of God and the blessings of God and God himself and a relationship with God, you need to make God your own. Amen. Could it be that you're here this morning and you are not sure of your eternal destination? Right. Meaning when you die on this earth, and we all will die, that's what the Bible says, and death passed upon all men. There is no exception. Death is not a respecter of persons. All of us will die. When you die, where will you spend eternity? There's only one of two options. There is no purgatory. There's only heaven with the Lord or hell. Eternal separation from God. You can't have the right relationship with God. You can't have the right view of God if you never accept his free gift. God freely offers salvation. Just as he did to Hezekiah with Sennacherib, he offered him free salvation. And God offers you salvation from certain destruction as well. All you have to do is accept his free gift. He sent his own son. One most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sent Jesus Christ. He sent his son so that none should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. You're not sure of your eternal destination. You're not sure if you're going to heaven or hell. That's not something to guess. That's not something to say, oh, I don't know. The Bible says today is the day right. of salvation. You don't know, don't play with your eternal soul. Right. Just, as the Lord Hezekiah, just as the Lord saved Hezekiah and Judah, God desires to save you. But he does not force himself upon any man. He offers his gift freely, but he will not force himself upon you. If you are not saved, do not leave this room. Amen. Do not leave this property without settling your eternal soul. Because I guarantee God already knows what's in your heart. And he knows he's not in your heart. And you will stand before God at the great white throne of judgment. And he will judge you and say... I gave you chance, and you never accepted my son. Right. And he'll say these words, depart from me. I never knew you. Right. I gave you chances. I gave you a lifetime of chances to accept my son's free gift. Amen. Will that be you? How sad that would be. Oh, it's sad to see Hezekiah but how much more sad to live a life with so many opportunities yes. and to reject his son time and time again. Depart from me. I never knew you. What about you, saved individual? Has the things of God, has the blessings of God risen to a place they should not be? Have they taken the place of the one that was the giver and the provider? Has your relationship with him been supplanted by his goodness and blessings, by his graciousness? How sad and unbelievable that is. That the one that gave it to us is no longer as important as the things he has given to us. And let's be honest. That's us. The things we have. Are far more important. Than the God that gave them to us. Because if it was the other way around. 
our lives would be much different. The way we act, the way we would talk, the way we would carry ourselves would be of a whole different caliber because I don't care about the things I have. I care about the one that gave them to me. You see, because if you have a right relationship with God, you understand the things that God gave to you. Or as the Syrophoenician woman, she understood these are just crumbs from the master's table. Oh, there's so much more that's available. These things are just crumbs. But yet, we hold them up in high of a place. Sadly, even higher than God himself. We would allow ourselves to become more attached to the gifts and the goodness than the giver and the provider. Just like George Bailey. You see, George Bailey lost sight on the true wealth he had gained from serving and helping others. You see, because when George Bailey got to the place where he wanted to take his life, It was because he was only thinking about George Bailey. He was thinking about his problems, about his life. He didn't get to do this. I didn't get to become the world traveler. I wasted my life. I spent years and years. I'm in this old rundown house. It was all about yada, yada, yada. Woe is me. But when he took a step back and he got to really readjust his mind and think again of all the wonderful things he had been allowed to do. He had a mind change and say, you know what? It is a wonderful life. That's the whole premise of the story. To understand no matter how bad it gets, life is a gift. But What's more important? The God that gives the life or all the things we fill life with? Who's more important to you? When God tries you and he looks in your heart, what does he see? How far we can fall. You see, just because we're right at one time in our life, just because we're good at one time, just because I get saved and I love God and all the good things of God, we can just become just like Hezekiah and go so far that we're not even recognizable anymore as the great king Hezekiah. Have you allowed the good things of God to blind you from seeing God himself? You no longer see him, you no longer feel him because you're worried about the temporal things. All the things, all the blessings. Church family, have you been faithful in your walk with the Lord? It's the little things of life that keep you grounded. Saying go, stay low and go slow. What is that talking about? Being humble. You see, if you have an understanding of little things, you understand there's nothing big that's not made of little things. So if I can keep my eyes on the little things, I don't have to worry about the big things. Because if I keep the little things the way they ought to be, the big things will be just fine. But you see, when we get lifted up in pride, like Hezekiah, look at all the things I have. We forget of the little thing that we are and all the things that we have is only because of the goodness of God. If I said, hey, everyone that's read your Bible this past week, every single day of this past week, stand up. Would that be an embarrassing time for the Anchor Baptist Church family? Would that be a time of hanging head in shame that, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really read my Bible this week. Oh, I just gave a token, you know, 
the one verse before I go to sleep so I can say I read my Bible. <laughs> if that's all God's, God is to you, if that's all God is important to you, then I think you're much more like Hezekiah at the end of his reign than you like to admit. Because right. how did Hezekiah get to the place he was? Because his walk with the Lord was not important anymore. I guarantee you, the Hezekiah that stood when Sennacherib was outside, that Hezekiah was not one of, oh, let me just read a verse before I go to sleep. No, I think that Hezekiah, the word of the Lord, is much more important to that Hezekiah than to the Hezekiah at the end. If your walk with the Lord is slipping, if your time in the Bible is no longer important, maybe you have become the new Hezekiah. The things of God and his goodness and his blessings are more valuable to you than God and your relationship with him. How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him to str that he might know all that was in his heart. What is God seeing in your heart? Is he pleased? And says, wow. Just like David, they have a heart that's after mine own. Or have you become the new Hezekiah? Ah, uh, I've got a lot of stuff. It's not going to happen while I'm king. It's okay. It's all good. It's those that come after me that will deal with the problem, not me. I get to enjoy all the good stuff. They won't, <laughs> but I do. The days of Hezekiah will be good. How sad. How far he has fallen. What's your heart saying? Let's pray. Dear Father, I pray.